Joining us now, we have staff writer at The Atlantic, Derek Thompson. He's out with a new piece, Why Americans Die So Much. U.S. lifespans, which have fallen behind those in Europe, are telling us something important about American society. Derek, it's so great to see you. Great to be back. Thank you. Good to see you, Derek. Let's just start with the facts here. Uh, something we've tracked closely, certainly at this show over years at this point, is the fact that mortality is declining in the U.S. But I actually hadn't thought to really compare it to, okay, well, how are we doing versus the rest of the developed world? That's what you take a, a look at here. What did you find, Derek? There's two really interesting points about this new study that came out just last week. Uh, the first point is that in 1990, American lifespans were basically the same as every country in Western Europe, the same as Germany, same as UK, same as Spain. And in the last 30 years, something has happened. There has been this divergence between Western Europe, where almost uh, every country has average lifespan over 80, and the US, where we sort of hit 79, and then it started to fall back from that. Uh, so that's the dark side of this story. But there's a light side, too, uh, in, this, in this finding, which is that, you know, historically, there has always been this large black-white gap, this difference between the average lifespan of a black American and a white American. But interestingly, and almost kind of like paradoxically, that has fallen in the last 30 years. Uh, the black-white gap has actually fallen by 50%. And so the way that I sort of think about twinning these two stories that seem to pull apart, like America is doing well, but America is doing horribly, is that the way that we're falling behind Europe, the reasons we're falling behind Europe might be fixed if we pay attention to exactly why we've been successful at raising black longevities relative to white longevity in the last 30 years. That has to do with Medicaid expansion. It has to do fundamentally with policy. Lifespan, I think, is a policy choice, and we, to, and we need to make more right choices rather than wrong ones. So what happened there? Uh, I mean, I hate to open up this can of worms, but is it basically that we prioritized like minority health care over like majority health care? What exactly were the specific policy choices that created both a collapse in the divergence, but overall an increase in the death rate of the country? Right. So I think it's important to point out that Americans on average live longer than they did in 1990. It's just that our our growth of lifespan hasn't been anything like Europe's growth, right? Okay. And so you're thinking, okay, why is that the case? Why are we falling behind in progress? The answer, I think, comes down to equality. There is something about treating everyone's life as if it is equal at the national healthcare level that seems to be better for everybody's outcome. You know, some people who are against egalitarian policy sometimes say, well, yes, Europe has more equal uh, policies, but it's all one big mediocre muddle. Um, well, actually, rich Europeans live longer than rich Americans. That was one of the really fascinating findings of this study. Uh, so the answer to your question, I think, is that starting in the 1990s, we did a couple things that made a really big difference, I think, in black longevity. Uh, we expanded Medicaid so that we had much better outcomes for pregnant women and minority infants. We expanded the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit, and that reduced various measures of poverty among both white and non-white Americans. And that was really good for increasing longevity uh, in, in low-income areas. But we're not doing it enough. We still don't have perfectly universal health care. We still have the most inequality in the OECD. We still have the highest poverty rates in the OECD. And so the big blaring lesson that I took from this paper is keep going. Keep moving toward the kind of social democracy that we see in Europe producing these extraordinarily longer lifespans, not only for the poor, but also for the rich. This is a kind of free lunch that we can have, that social democracy can help everybody live longer, whether they live in the poorest counties or the richest. And Derek, I think people will actually find this kind of shocking because in America, we take it for granted that rich people live longer than poor people. We just assume that's just the way it is. That's not the case in Europe. Um, you write here that Europe's mortality rates are actually very, very similar between the richest community and the poorest communities. Just dig into that data. I think you summarized it very well. Uh, uh, in the U.S., where you live determines when you'll die to a certain extent. People who live in high poverty areas die years and years before people who live in low poverty areas. In Europe, that's just not the case. And this is really surprising to me as someone who was born in America, lived in America, and I guess has sort of internalized various American truths that like, of course the rich tend to live longer. It's not a good thing, but they tend to live longer than the poor. 
In Europe, by contrast, what the, this research found is that if you divvy up the countries of you know Germany and France and the UK by uh, by high and low poverty, the people who grow up and live in low poverty areas live about the exact same amount of time as those who live in the high poverty areas. Again, not only does the US have higher poverty than Europe, but also poverty impacts death more in the US than it does in Europe. So again, back to the thesis statement, the big picture here is that equal egalitarian policies seem to be better for everyone when we think about life. And that really is what you know modern welfare states should be about or modern government should be about. How do we increase, uh, how do we keep our citizens alive? Europe seems to be much better at it, not just in COVID, but over the last 30 years. Well, and this is also interesting because it's not, um, we're, we're also not doing that well by our rich people who aren't living as long as the rich people in Europe. So I also had this sort of assumption that, you know, you have this rich poor gap in terms of life expectancy, but surely our rich people, because they have everything at their disposal and the best doctors and the best food and all of this stuff, surely they would be doing as well as their global counterparts. But that's actually not even the case. So what's going on there? Right. So what this mostly has to do with, you know, one way you can sort of look at these mortality statistics, and I won't make this sort of too granular, is you can sort of break it up by age, right? You can say in the U.S. versus Europe, are babies more or less likely to live to five? Are teenagers more or less likely to live to 20? Are adults more or less likely to live to 65? And in all of those buckets, Europeans beat Americans and rich Europeans beat rich Americans. So the only advantage or equality the U.S. seems to have with Europe is that if you make it to 70, then the outcomes for rich Americans seem to be basically the same as the outcomes for rich Europeans. But it's getting to 70 that is so much more unequal. And we can throw in a bunch of stuff into our sort of explanatory jambalaya, right? We can say, well, you know, of course Americans are more likely to die of gun deaths because there are more guns in America. Uh, Americans are more likely to die in traffic accidents, not because we have a higher fatality rate per mile driven, but because we drive more miles. There's just way more cars in America and way more driving from the suburbs. Um, but it, it, you really, I think, need to look at the big picture of egalitarian policy to be able to explain all of this at once. There seems to be something very special about the sort of social democratic outlook on healthcare and poverty, such that it's not just that it helps the low income and the middle income, it helps all of us. Mm. This is a policy from which we all can win. How do you rule out cultural explanations? For example, like they eat differently, drink differently, um, you know, eat rich or poor, that kind of co comes across the income gap and more. Opioid deaths is another thing that we have to contend with. How, how do you arrive so confidently at the healthcare explanation and not a lot of these other things? Fantastic question. So I, you can't rule out these sort of be behavioral differences if you only look at lower income Americans and Europeans where the differences are largest, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not just saying that low income Americans are the only ones who eat junk food. It's just that low income people around the world are more likely to consume certain kinds of food and have certain kinds of habits. And what you see in, uh, but, but you can't necessarily make that same point about rich Americans and rich Europeans, right? There are a lot of rich American health nuts in yep. America, but overall, Rich Americans in the lowest poverty areas do not live longer than rich Europeans in the lowest poverty areas. And that suggests to me, because of the universality of these findings across ages and across income levels, that a national explanation at the government level is more likely than a behavioral explanation, which is more likely to be stratified by income in the US. Hmm. Derek, are other nations experiencing the same rise in deaths of despair as we are? Uh, initially, no, they were not. Uh, but my understanding is that as of more recently, uh, uh, opioid deaths seem to be rising uh, in, in places like Western Europe, but nothing like they are in the U.S. To be totally honest, I'm not an expert on mm -hmm. uh, a sort of contemporary European changes in deaths of despair, <laughs> so I don't want to go sort of too far down that road. Yeah. Um, but I, 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 I recall reading, I pretty confidently recall reading, this is a trend that started in America, and like so many other things that start in America, seems to be uh, mildly exported uh, across the Atlantic. Well, look, a lot of lessons here, no matter really where you are on the spectrum. The piece. rich part in particular really drove it home to me. So thank you, Derek. Great piece. But we also understand you've got a book coming out. So could you tell us... Uh
about the book is called, title, where people can pre-order, all of that. Um, I'm sorry, and I think that was a, so I just went on book leave. Okay. Um, and I am writing a book uh, about right. how to solve the world's biggest problems faster. Good. I think it's gonna be great, uh, but it probably won't come out until 2023. Okay. Uh, right. So, you know, everyone just mark their calendar at the end of 2023 <laughs> summer. And I'm so excited for you to buy my book. Then. Awesome. Well, awesome. We can't wait to read I'm it. Buy it. It's going to be a worry. long wait. All right. Thanks, Derek. <laughs> Thanks, Appreciate Derek. Great to Thanks, see you. Guys. All right, everybody, thank you so much for watching. We really appreciate it. Um, if you guys could help us out, become a premium subscriber today. Link is down there in the description. Look, we don't often open up the curtain on this, but we were talking about this yesterday, Crystal. Our segments on 9-11, Epstein, Lab Leak, a lot of this stuff, it gets completely demonetized. Even on Elizabeth Holmes' trial. Me Too, because, right? Or anything regarding right. Me Too, Time's Up organization protecting Cuomo, like... Almost all of these topics are routinely getting demonetized. Yes, like I want people to understand. <laughs> Here's the thing. We cover the news. The news is not always pretty. Vaccines, booster shots, Fauci, lab leak, uh, 9-11. I mean, like, you can't live in an environment where you're covering the news and you have to avoid certain topics. Now, we are pledged, absolutely, we're never gonna do that. You know, it will never impact our coverage, but this is the only way that we can support the production. So it means a lot. That's with the link down there in the description. And obviously we try to give as much premium benefits. You know, you get the show an hour early, listen to it, all of that. But I want you who support us and for those of you who watch the show, just to understand like what we have to deal with yeah. whenever it comes to really bringing you the information we think is the most important because that is always what the chief goal of this program is going to be and this is what it's like you know we're not vloggers out there like pulling pranks we have to cover serious <laughs> stuff yeah and serious stuff apparently um doesn't really fit it's controversial yeah. um yeah you guys support means that when we see that demonetization is just like eh, yeah we're like whatever we'll be fine right. you know because that way it doesn't even get into the back of your head about ah, i don't know if we want to mm -hmm. do this segment because we're human beings and if your entire model and ability to continue was based on the youtube revenue and whether or not the youtube gods are gonna let you monetize certain content or not there's no doubt that that would have some impact and incentivize you to avoid certain topics but just imagine the insanity of demonetizing every segment to do with 9-11. I know, what like, are we supposed to do? The I mean, Saudi papers, obviously we, we have to talk about it. We didn't do anything like right. crazy or conspiratorial. It was just right. like, you know, remembering what happened and here's some new information that was, here's an AP article mm -hmm. about a new document that's been released. But just having 9-11 in the headline is enough for them to say, no, we can't do that. So. Right. Anyway, all a long way of saying that um, we're so grateful for you guys and the support that you've given us. Um, if you're able to sign up as a premium subscriber, it is really important to just help us maintain our complete independence here. Yep. We love you guys so much. Have a fantastic weekend, and we will see you. Wait a second. What Thursday. Day is it? We'll see you on Thursday. We'll see you Thursday. Yeah, Thursday. I never know. I'm getting ahead of myself. Yeah. <laughs> see you all Thursday. Have a all good right. one.
Hey guys, thanks so much for watching. That's right. Just as a reminder, you can become a premium subscriber today. Watch the full show completely uncut. Our reactions to each other's monologues. You get to listen to it. You get to ask us questions. All that good stuff. Link is right there in the description or at breakingpoints.com. Best of all, great way to say screw you to the mainstream media.